Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. We're just going to give people a couple more minutes to join. Um, so in the meantime, please, uh, if you would type into the chat box on your control panel where you're joining us from. All right, we have Dallas. Anybody else out there from Dallas? Okay, we have the UK, we have Istanbul. Chicago. Very neat. All right, so we're going to go ahead and kick this off. So hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, CH2M Leverages the Cloud to Improve Project Delivery. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You are listening in using your computer's uh, speaker system by default, but if you prefer to join over the phone, uh, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. In order to make this a more dynamic webinar, we encourage you to please submit text questions to today's presenter via the questions pane on the control panel, which is uh, where you have entered your locations just a few seconds ago. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. Please also note that today's presentation is available for download via our attendee webinar panel. So without further ado, Dean Edmondson, EVP of Business Development at LoadSpring will now introduce our speaker. Thanks, Christiane. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time to join us for this webinar today. As Christiane mentioned, we want this to be a very collaborative uh, experience for you, and please do enter your questions as, as they arise during the presentation. We also built a few polls into the webinar, and I'd like to start off with the first poll before I introduce Michelle just to learn a little bit more of the type of organization you're working for. So you should see on your screen now uh, a poll. It says, which type of organization do you work for with five different options? If you could please click on the option, and then we will share the results of this poll uh, after we take a minute or two for everybody to collect their information. Okay, it looks like everybody's submitted, so let me close this out, and I'm going to share the results here. So overwhelmingly, we have uh, you know a very strong presence from the engineering and construction industry, uh, a few consultants, so a few software vendors, and a few people from the other side. Now we have three other polls throughout the session that Michelle and I have coordinated, so um, you know be aware that those will be coming up throughout or we'll be asking you more questions about your experience and, and how, you're, uh, how you're working in your different environments. So let me close this out now. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michelle Stewart. Michelle is the Enterprise Director of Project Controls at CH2M Hill. She has over 15 years of experience in commercial and government sectors, including oil and gas, power, transportation, water, government facilities, and environmental markets. Her formal education is a Bachelor of Business uh, with high honors and an executive MBA from the University of Denver. So without further ado, let me pass the reins over to Michelle. Thanks, Dean. I'm really excited uh, when you asked me to talk about mitigating project risks with an effective cloud forward strat strategy. Um, I think there's a lot we're doing here at CH that um, uh, really contributes to that. Um, so the way we're going to break it down today, it's going to be interactive. I really, I really like that. A couple polls throughout as we work our way through the agenda. Um, but we're going to kick off with talking a little bit about CH, 
Um, and then what is our approach to enterprise project control systems? And what's the strategy? How have we gotten to where we are? Um, and with business intelligence in mind, um, it's something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. And we've been working very closely with LoadSpring on uh, transitioning a lot of our applications to the cloud. Um, so I want to talk about some of the important uh, notes uh, there. And uh, Dell Tech Acumen Fuse, um, that's a great tool, a scheduling and risk mitigation tool that um, I promote within the company and that we have great utilization, um, helps mitigate risks all along the project. So to start off with CH, I have worked here for almost seven years. Um, CH2M it comes from uh, the first or the last names of our founding fathers, uh, Cornell, Holland, Hayes, and Mary Field. Um, these folks started the company over 70 years ago. Um, it was a water company. And, uh, and it's grown so much in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we now have diverse capabilities across the water, transportation, energy, environmental, and industrial markets. Um, and you know our our uh, goal is to work side by sides with our clients to lay the foundation for human progress. Um, you know we get into iconic projects like London Olympics, Q22, um, and uh, all the likes, and uh, have 20,000 employees around the world. Um, so very diverse company. Um, but from a technology perspective, we're very innovative, and, and that's what's been the most uh, um, attractive part of CH to me is very innovative in the technology space, and, and that uh, shows in the strategic initiatives that we, um, we invest in. And uh, CH, you know, very much so uh, is always pushing the envelope and, and making sure that we're leveraging uh, the best tool set um, to mitigate risks and, and create value for our, our customers. Um, so, you know, looking at this slide, uh, supporting our technology strategy, hyperconnectivity is a big part of that. Time to value is something that our is a value proposition that our customers demand. Um, we need to be able to go from pursuit to delivery quickly, um, transition from planning um, into delivery, and uh, making sure that we can quickly deploy the supporting tools and technology stacks. Um, and that's through a lot through thought leadership and, and making sure we have standardization across the company. We need to work smarter, not harder. And so we're always trying to come up with, um, you know, we're trying to scan uh, the environment for the, for the best in class tools um, to support our uh, delivery of projects. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we all struggle, uh, have infrastructure challenges um, delivering these tool sets out. And I think uh, the days of people being afraid of the cloud, companies being afraid of the cloud, has kind of ended. And uh, I'm starting to see a lot of us transition into more of a cloud-forward strategy. Um, it just makes sense uh, with infrastructure challenges that, that we've faced. And it makes us, it's much easier to deploy tools and um, products out to um, our clients. And, and what that all leads to is repeatability. That's what we want. We want predictability in the results, in our margins. And at the end of the day, this is all underpinned by risk and, and really creating value for our customers. A little bit about CH2M Enterprise Project Controls. Um, been with the company again seven years, have seen the evolution of the Project Controls job family, and uh, actually helped remap um, all our job family members into an HR. Uh, system and, and we were all um, organized and, and really what that does is it, it, it raises the validity and, and the need for project controls to be um, seen as a career path at our company and um, with that came directors of project controls so there was um, you know easy access to the people at the top and they were influenced influential and in making decisions and, and uh, that really flows down into the people part of it. And, and we have managers of talent that help you all along your career path. So I think it's a real big differentiator for CH in the people space. Um, and then in process, uh, you know, there's a couple thoughts I have here on process. Um, having been at a, a couple other large EPC companies um, and working my way through CH, uh, processes and procedures are, are an interesting subject. Um, you know, process and procedures are hard to write, they're even harder to implement, and they're really impossible to me measure compliance. 
And often, oftentimes our policies are really written like procedures and our procedures are really written like work instructions. They're way too detailed and one of the initiatives that CH2M took on is a project simple and simplifying our processes and streamlining them and, and that's been a real game changer for us. Um, and uh, you know, to me, I think the, the, you can spend a lot of time and effort and resources, and we do on these processes and procedures, writing that sort of golden ticket, but at the end of the day, I really think that the best way to change behavior, um, drive good practice, is really through tools. And so that's why, um, as the director of project controlled systems, I'm so um, uh, engaged on the tool front, um, and we're, we've done a lot of work in the last three years. Um, we now have a standard application software list that we manage uh, year over year. We look at license utilization. Um, we're also scanning the environment for new technology. Um, and then global support. Uh, when you talk about an enterprise deployment, um, you, you really need to be able to support across the globe. And one of the ways we do that is through cloud hosting and 24-7 uh, support. One of the things that we like about LoadSpring is not only do they provide the technical aspect, but they also provide um, some functional support and things like Primavera and Acumen Fuse. Um, so I, I think all of this underpins mitigating risks for our client and, and increasing um, their, their bottom line growth. Um, so I think that CH has a lot of differentiators in the people process tool space. Um, this uh, this graph uh, graphic off to the right is sort of near and dear to my heart, Fred Long's heart here at the enterprise. Um, we put this together in April of 2015. Um, it was a one-pager vision chart. Um, those are often the best ones to use to go make strategic initiatives um, with your, um, you know, with the leaders in your organization. And this one-pager really didn't change at all. And um, I, I'm happy to say we've actually executed on it. Um, so in April we created this, uh, October we got capital funding to go deliver it, and by August um, we were deploying enterprise-wide. Um, and the BI reporting uh, was ultimately the end, but I'll talk real briefly just to break it down. Um, our project mix uh, typically breaks into an 80-20, I think most, most companies do, 20% um, of our projects are um, more complex design build EPC projects. Um, they typically use uh, estimating higher, sort of more sophisticated estimating tools like Timberline, HCSS. They usually have a resource loaded schedule and a quantitative risk register. And those people were perfect candidates for Ecosys. Ecosys is our enterprise project controls tool for the company. Um, and then our, our sort of lower impact projects um, that are quick burns that, um, that uh, uh, they, they have, um, uh, from an estimating standpoint, use our internally developed tool called Pricer and typically have MS project schedules and they were good candidates for Forecaster. Forecaster was a light version, Excel-based tool, um, quick startup and, and all of this was really to sunset all these business group specific um, systems. Uh, I've done it um, and I know a lot of people out in the business groups go do this because they don't have access to the information, because we don't have an enterprise project control system. They're creating these single point solutions that are not supported by IT and that can't be replicated. Um, so it's so important to um, really deploy an enterprise caliber solution. Um, and with BI at the end, it's all about our data, the big data revolutions here, and um, we're, we're taking advantage of it at CH. Um, and uh, all these tools, all that information, all that data funnels into our BI reporting tool. Um, and we're really excited about that. We migrated over 10,000 projects onto this suite of tools um, back in April of this year, and uh, we continue in advance the BI reporting. So when we start to talk about, uh, you know, what does our ERP system have? And, and what is, you know, as we were creating that vision chart, it was really kind of addressing the state of affairs. And, and when you break it down like these two graphics do, I, I think it uh, almost creates its business case for itself. Um, 
so on the, I'll start with the, the graphic on the right. Um, if you look into your ERP system data, and, and we're pretty sophisticated, we have a global data warehouse where we download a lot of that data, the reality is that it stores data in a time phase way for actual costs. All the transactions are date time stamped. But then it asks you for a budget at completion or an estimate at completion as sort of a data point. And, and that's important for revenue recognition, and there's a lot of things that they do in the accounting and finance space, and, and that makes sense, but there's no point in time associated with that budget at completion and that EAC. We don't know how, when it's going to get finished, and we certainly don't know how to draw the line from the actual cost up to that EAC. How are we going to get there? What's our forecast, our time phase forecast? Um, and so the ERP system really doesn't give you the data you, data you need, which is why you need an enterprise project controls solution. Um, off on the left, uh, and again, you know, we've all done it. Because without an enterprise project controls solution, you're out there trying to collate data and create, turn that data into information and then into a report. And by the time you get done with that process, you're handing it off to the PM and they start to find issues. The analysis doesn't happen early enough or often enough. Um, and so, you know, one of the things about, when you think about that, it, it really comes down to data. And, and how do we leverage data in the best way possible? Um, and there's a couple sort of tenants that I've, I've started to pick up on as I've deployed this in the last six to eight months. Um, standardization. Uh, to, to really uh, create a data solution in the project management, project delivery space, uh, you really have to standardize on what are the KPIs that we care about. And so that from one sector to another sector, we're not talking about different, thinking we're talking about the same thing, but it's actually being different. Standardization is key. Um, and, and what's important about that is you have to create a single source of truth. Um, you know, we're all out in the spreadsheet jungle creating these reports, and there's not a single source of truth. So you really have to um, start as you're, you're building your BI roadmap, decide which tools are going to be the standard for the company um, so that they become the source of truth um, in a BI, in, in sort of like a BI output. Um, and, and all what we're driving towards is actionable intelligence. We don't want this big data. We want this big data to be digested down into information and presented to you in a report so that you can um, make actions with it and, and determine, um, you know, uh, corrective actions um, ahead of time so you've got early warning indicators um, and, and really mitigate any problem projects um, along the way. And then automation, that's another thing that I think we're going to start talking a lot more about. Uh, let's get out of the paperwork business and into um, the automation business where uh, simple workflows, um, things like that are automated, um, that are date time stamped, and that um, really enhance efficiency. And what all that can do is also create data that, that can then be migrated to a BI platform. Um, and so we leverage that at CH. We have an EAC policy. Um, it's one of the, the policies that's really been a game changer for us in the project control space because it required that a PCM, a PM, a project manager, and a project accountant all sign off. And when I said PCM, project controls manager, um, all three of those folks all have, um, have to sign off on the estimate at completion for the project. And as you can imagine from a Sarbanes-Oxley uh, standpoint, you know, we used to do that on um, pieces of paper and load it into decentralized document control systems. Um, now with automation, um, first of all, we've raised the importance of engaging project controls, but we've also uh, now have date time stamps for every single person that's approved along the way, and that's for forever memorialized in the tool. So automation is another important benefit Along with integration, um, you know, a lot of the benefit that you get with these platforms is when they're integrated, when they are sending like information from one system to the other, so you're removing duplicate entry, um, you're minimizing double keying, and uh, you're, you're in creating efficiency. And, and that's really where the bang for the buck comes, is as soon as you start to tie these, these systems together, but it all requires standardization. 
And then finally, uh, BI, uh, you know, information protection, information security is such an important thing these days. And a BI platform allows you to centralize that and control the information um, and, and who gets it and how they get it. And, and, um, and not only that, this actionable intelligence that we come up with, you know, we tell people what they need to be looking at, what's important to the company today. So um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for BI. I love uh, the business intelligence aspect of what we've delivered. And, um, and this is what we're seeing now. This is uh, us achieving the Enterprise Project Control's vision. Um, on the far right, that was our future state. We wanted to look into our data and be able to see a performance measurement baseline. What is my measuring stick? Um, to also see uh, earn value metrics come in so that we can do early warning uh, across portfolios, CPIs, SPIs, CVs, SVs. Um, and then what, how do we get up to our ETC? What, what's the dotted line? And does that look attainable? Is that too steep? Do we have the staff to support it? Um, the simple S-curve uh, we now have for all 10,000 projects. Um, so we're real excited about that. There's been a lot done. And, and you can see here off to the left how we've, uh, by delivering a business intelligent solution, we have gotten more into the business of analyzing data and um, being able to mitigate the data. Um, and so that's all about risk mitigation and uh, leveraging um, the business intelligence platform that was delivered. Okay. Uh, Michelle, do you mind if I break in on that last slide for a moment? Yep. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, a few of you are coming into the chat asking Michelle what BI solutions she's using today. So I, I think in a future slide she's definitely going to talk to that. Uh, but why don't we take another poll here? We have a poll that we'd like to share with you to learn about the BI solutions that you're using today. So if you could take a minute to click on the ones that you're using, uh, and then we'll share the results with the broader audience. Wow, this is uh, I'm watching this dynamically, and the results are interesting. Okay. Uh, it's still changing here, so I'll give give one more, five more seconds here, and I'm going to close this one out. Okay, so here we go. Share these with the team. So it's definitely other. There's a number of other solutions. I have to imagine that Excel is probably part of that. And then there's uh, Tableau, Power BI, and Click seem to be the predominant players in the market today. All right, let me hand it back off to Michelle to continue her. Yep, um, that's interesting. Yeah, we've, uh, we've dabbled in all of those. Um, the current solution we use is OBIEE. Um, we came with our R12 instance, um, so we're leveraging that um, as our tool, but I actually have instances of Microsoft Power BI and Tableau being used throughout the company. Um, so moving on to uh, LoadSpring and leveraging a risk-adjusted cloud strategy. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that's so important to our clients is that we're able to deliver um, with flexibility and speed, the technology they need to go, go deliver their, their products um, or their uh, solutions. And um, you can see off to the left, uh, LoadSpring can, can host a whole lot of tools. Um, it has a lot of um, depth of knowledge with these tools. Um, we, of course, have a, a stack, which you see off to the right, um, that we're um, in the process of migrating, some of them are complete. Um, we've got uh, quite a few other tools that have already been done, but these are the, the real focuses in the short term. Uh, Deltek, Acumen Fuse, and Cobra, uh, Sage Estimating, Oracle, uh, Primavera P6, and Ecosys. All of those are being migrated onto the LoadSpring cloud, um, which will help free up from an infrastructure standpoint um, a lot of the sort of turn and issues that we have, um, and I could, uh, I'll go in more depth there, but um, uh, one of the advantages that we get from the CH2M cloud platform is the ability to track our licenses in a much more standardized and streamlined way. 
Um, I don't know how many of you folks manage licenses for the enterprise. Um, you know, we have a suite of tools uh, that, that we do have enterprise licenses for, and, and we deploy them out. Um, we have a standard approval process. Um, but we're managing the licensing through um, spreadsheets. And, uh, you know, and then you start to get into situations where it's hosted on Citrix, um, and then this one's hosted, um, you know, on their system as a standalone. Uh, and, and, it, and it becomes hard to manage and wieldy. And, and typically, the, the folks that are sort of tasked to go, go manage all these um, deployments, uh, you know, not necessarily right sized. And so, load spring, transitioning to load spring has been a, a huge benefit for, benefit for us, and we continue to add on. Um, you can see here, uh, this is one of the big benefits uh, for us is you have a geospatial view into who's using which licenses and, and how and when, um, which to come up with this information, we have to make some assumptions. Um, and so this is a, a huge reason for us to, to transition to Load Spring. Um, it streams, streamlines our ability to deliver our technology out to the customers much more quickly. Um, not to mention uh, the global support. Um, we, have, we have a ServiceNow uh, team here at CH, and uh, they do a good job. Um, we used to call them TAC, uh, but getting the 24 Seven global support was where we had issues, and, and we're a global company, and we have large, important programs in the UK and Dubai and all over the world that we need to support. Um, so that was a huge adder for us, um, and, it, and it mitigates the risk. We, we need to have more uptime and, uh, and, and not have to explain why, we, why the system has gone down. Um, so there's some cost savings there. And then there's also cost savings. This is maybe a little known fact is that uh, we were sitting on SQL boxes for all our P6, and we were able to transition to Oracle boxes. Um, and that's a huge benefit for us, um, all part of the, the LoadSpring platform. Um, and again, centralized application access and management. Um, this allows us to get better insights into who's using the tool um, and how often, and how can we reallocate or, or do we need to um, bring in more licenses for any specific tool to, to meet the needs of the company? Um, to date, that, that's been a hard thing for us to, to um, manage, and, and we're very excited to work with LoadSpring um, to deliver that out to all our end users. And then another benefit, uh, you know, as you get to talk to these folks, the value proposition continues to grow. Um, one of the things that, um, I always like to hear is on the software upgrades. You know, just all the systems deploy multiple versions, um, and not all of them are created equal. And uh, that's where LoadSpring really helps advise uh, advises people like me. Hey, let's not go with this version. We're going to wait till the next version, or um, let's go to this let's go to this version, but let's wait uh, for the second service pack. Things like that. They're they're very engaged. They're in front of. And, and they provide recommendations, and then, then they actually do the upgrading, um, which, as you know, takes a lot of time um, and resources to manage that, and especially when you're talking about a suite of tools uh, that we offer. Okay. Can, can I break in again for another poll question, Michelle? Yes. I keep missing the poll. Yes. No worries. So let me, on the theme of cloud, let me ask the, the question to the audience of how do you leverage the cloud today for your project applications? Are you using LoadSpring Cloud? Does your IT department leverage AWS or Azure, or are you just starting to, to explore the cloud? So if you could click on the box that most applies, we'll share the results here in a second. <clears throat> It's interesting to watch these results live. Uh, you, it's, it's almost like some of these polls you have on TV. You get to a dead even heat, 33, 33, 33, and then there's a definite winner coming at the end. So let me share this. I'm going to close this out. <clears throat> Here are the results. So there's a lot of people just, explore, just starting to explore the cloud. A quarter of the group is using LoadSpring today. Uh, while exploring, while some are also exploring AWS and Azure. So thank you for your feedback there. We appreciate that. There'll be one more survey. And then if I can remind everybody, please use um, or please
continue to add your questions to the chat section. I see that there's three or four questions there already, so we'll, we'll be asking those here briefly. I'm going to hand it back off to you, Michelle. Thanks, Dean. Um, so uh, this is our standard application software list um, that uh, we have as a SharePoint site out available to the enterprise. Um, and this is where folks go to look at our suite of tools. Um, you know, oftentimes clients will will ask for specific sets of tools, um, but these are the ones we recommend um, and that we often uh, propose. Um, and and we break them into the different functional areas of estimating, cost control, planning, scheduling, risk management, and document control. Um, and uh, and then you can see off to the right, business intelligence um, is its uh, own thing because not only does it deliver um, sort of the project delivery, project controls life cycle, we also have uh, gone into more of the ops dashboards that includes P&L pivots and things of that nature. So it sort of sits a little bit higher than the project control system suite. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, this is, again, uh, one of the things that we manage. So month over month, month, or year over year, we go through an annual business planning process. And we sit down and, and go through licensing structures. And then we talk about initiatives. Um, you know, where are we going to spend time to enhance and further the company? Um, and uh, through a lot of our... Um, day-to-day, -day, things like acumen fuse uh, rise to the forefront. Um, you know, as we start to do schedule analysis, um, and especially in the pursuit phase, uh, one of the things that we always do is run acumen through acumen fuse um, through schedule and risk analysis. Um, Primavera P6, uh, we are in the middle of migrating that onto LoadSpring. We're going to be able to consolidate 42 databases down to 10 databases. Um, so much more streamlined. We're going to create more standardized structures, um, EPS nodes, including coding. Um, so just a little bit of a cleaning house as part of this, this onloading project. Um, and, and with that project, uh, the plan is to migrate it first into the environment of SQL. And then uh, they actually have a tool that we're able to leverage that um, can migrate the SQL uh, projects into Oracle databases. And uh, we're real excited to do that. I think uh, Primavera P6 is, is one of the things on the forefront that, that you know, people need quickly and they need access when they want it. And um, we're trying to uh, be able to deliver that much more quickly with uh, LoadSpring. So talking a little bit more about Acumen Fuse, um, this is a tool that I, I've spent some time with, uh, you know, in our pursuit phase uh, with uh, some large DB projects. Um, you create these pretty, pretty good level two, level three schedules, and and this this is a wonderful tool to run it through the DCMA 14 point assessment. These are things that don't have to be DCMA, but they they there are things that we all should care about, things like missing logic, logic density, um, how many constraints do we have, negative float, um, number of leads. This tool is all housed in, in a package for you. You can run across your schedule and identify risks, um, risky areas within that schedule with a push of a button. Um, and, and it actually gives you a score at the end and tells you you're going to be uh, 60 or 70 percent likely to finish this project as you've scheduled it, as the logic um, flows through. So, uh, you know, it really is about mitigating risk early uh, for us, and, and it's a tool that we promote um, throughout our organization. And, and it's led to improved schedule quality and increased confidence in that schedule. Um, and, and it really is about starting at the foundation. Uh, making sure that uh, the schedule meets not only scoping deliverables, but uh, protects us um, from, uh, you know, meeting our milestones and making sure that we can quickly identify any sort of crashing that needs to happen, any sort of um, acceleration that's required, um, and it, it really gives you sort of the, the visualization of that with this heat map that you see. 
So we're big fans of the Acumen tool. Um, it tracks and manages project risks as well, um, leads to more reliability in our project finish dates. And, and as you know, with these, these projects, especially the EPC where they have razor thin margins and aggressive schedules, um, being able to get to this level of analysis is so important from a schedule and risk standpoint. Lastly, I'll just end, uh, you know, with the risk uh, versus reward uh, uh, value proposition. Uh, while strategic technology, people, processes, and tool initiatives are appropriate, risk mitigating is a must, and we take great pride in this ability during all phases of our business and customer projects. Um, you know, we talked a lot about uh, the strategic project controls initiative with the platform and delivering a business intelligent solution um, that that mitigates risk, uh, creates standardization, allows us to share resources across sectors. Um, people can pick up the baton and keep running with it. Um, our uh, load spring solution helps us mitigate the infrastructure risk. Our time to value has increased. We're able to get um, our tools out to our clients much quicker. And tools like Acumen Fuse, um, those are best in class scheduling analytic and risk analysis tools, and those are the tools that we invest in. And, and that's what helps us uh, differentiate from our competitors, being on the forefront and, and really working harder, not smarter, or working smarter, not harder. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Dean. Michelle, thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights uh, and, and also sharing with us you know, how you view all these different tools, processes, and people uh, across project controls. It's very insightful. Uh, what we'd like to do now is I have one poll, and if you could go to the next slide, Michelle. Mm -hmm. I have one poll that I want to share, but I also want to let uh, let you collect this information. Both LoadSpring as well as Deltek are making available to you a cloud assessment consultation, if you wish. Uh, you can collect the credentials right here and contact either of us. We'd be happy to speak with, with you about your risk assessment practices or your cloud, uh, future in cloud, 56% of you, according to the poll, are just beginning to explore the cloud, so we'd be happy to help you make a more informed decision there. Um, we'll keep that up here for a second. I'm gonna share this last poll, which is which software ap applications do you use today? If you could respond to this, we'll share the results, and then we're gonna jump right into the questions, and we have quite a few questions. <clears throat> so it looks like everybody is. All right. Oops, sorry. Looks like everybody has shared the response. So let me share. Uh, as we would expect, Microsoft, there's quite a few users of Microsoft out there, Oracle, Dell Tech, uh, Hexagon, and Esri. So there's a, as an array, we, we only have five. We, we would have put many more in here. I, I imagine that there's many applications or some customers were hosting 10, 15 different applications for them. But we wanted to get a sense of, you know, what types of tools, what types of applications you're, you're uh, leveraging today. So with that, let me close this out and let's get into questions. Michelle, we have quite a few. So let me start off with the first question. With regard to the S-curve that you uh, positioned earlier, do you have integration between your plan costs and your ERP and your project costs and schedule applications? And then add on to that, what frequency do you update the S-curve or do you report that out? Sure. Um, so the S curve uh, really doesn't live in our ERP system. It, you know, the ERP system does a great job tracking cost over time, um, and then in terms of a sort of uh, endpoint, what, what's my budget at completion? Um, and so, in terms of getting that plan cost, that plan cost curve, the baseline. Uh, that you see over time and how you plan to get to that budget at completion and then how you track that um, from a progressing standpoint as the, the project uh, goes on, that's all housed in our enterprise project controls systems. 
Um, those are the minimum data requirements out of the system. Um, those were designed, uh, that was by design early on, um, is that, uh, you know, what is the minimum output that we want from these tools um, that we can measure them all equally across. And, um, and so uh, that time phase data comes out into our business intelligence platform um, anytime a project submits their EAC. Because um, one of the conversations you'll get into with BI is timing. You know, you don't want in-progress data. And the in-progress data lives in your source system, in your enterprise project control system. But at the point in which you're saying, okay, the month is closed, this is my final numbers, this is my final time phasing, I've, I've considered all my costs, my actuals, my commitments, um, you then uh, sort of press the button and off the EAC goes, we've got the three approvals, and then that's all baselined and, and posted into business intelligence. So that is how we manage our S-curves. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Wade. What is your target number of databases for Primavera P6 to be hosted in LoadSpring? Um, so we're, uh, we've got the, the two-part approach. Uh, we're going to load all 42, which is kind of a lot. I've heard far more before. Um, so I think that's a, a pretty typical number you may end up with. Um, and we want to get it down to um, about 12. We have program instances uh, that are customized, and so we're, we're not going to be able to get away from those. Um, and then each of the sectors uh, has a right for um, you know, different calendars that they may need to set up. So uh, we're going to allocate out a couple to each of the sectors, and then we're going to have two enterprise uh, P6 databases. So down to 12. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is from Bob. Aren't there better tools than Microsoft Project to use as a CPM tool besides P6? So I guess, I guess it would be interesting to understand when you explore planning and scheduling solutions, what different tools do you, uh, do you evaluate in the marketplace? Well, Primavera is kind of the, the choice tool uh, for scheduling analytics and CPM scheduling. Um, and in Microsoft Project, uh, you know, we, we get a lot of Fed companies that use that. Um, and, and ideally, you know, you, you move into more of a Primavera type tool. Um, and in terms of scheduling tools that we review out in the marketplace, it's, it's typically tools that are add-ons to our P6 um, scheduling app, things like Acumen Fuse that you can set up on top of the tool to do your analytics. Um, it's like a claim digger on steroids. Um, and again, DCMA 14-point uh, assessment, if that's something you have to do, you know you spend a long time kind of compiling that, this is a one-button push. Um, and so when we uh, start to look at add-ons and things like that, it's really about delivering value to um, internally and externally, um, and, and typically in the analytics space. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here. Are your databases hosted at LoadSpring encrypted? Um, Dean, you might have to help me with that one. Um, uh, I yeah. Actually... yeah, yes, from our security, we, we have a security policy that encrypts the databases and we, we have a very secure environment. Um, we can actually get into more details as to how, that's hap how that happens on the back end. And I, uh, if, uh, this is a good point for me to share. So there are, there are many questions coming in. I'm, I'm uh, hesitant to believe that we're gonna be able to get to all of them. So if your questions aren't answered today, um, what we'll do is we'll capture all of these questions and we'll respond. Either Michelle, myself, or somebody from our team will respond to you uh, with more details. So let me, uh, let me jump to the next question while we still have some time here. Have you had any issues with provisioning for flexible cost breakdown structure and work breakdown structure configuration for various project clients? And then second to that, how does this impact BI tool output? So um, we do accommodate uh, flexible cost breakdown structures and work breakdown structures. Um, it, it's interesting. You go to, 
I've heard a couple of different conversations. You get into different conversations about this. A lot of people like to drive towards a standard or standard uh, cost breakdown structure. Um, obviously, to retain you know cost across projects that you can then compare and, and do some analytics on and, and better predict your results. So there's value add, but, it, but the ability to be flexible has to be there, and that's really where the WBS comes in. I think there's often confusion between the difference between a cost breakdown structure and a WBS. Um, I, I know that we we kind of have that uh, in varying degrees across our organization. I've, I've heard about it at other companies, um, but it's important to have them separate, and and that is best practice in in our uh, in our viewpoint and in the way that we train people. And uh, Ecosys does a great job of that. It has a cost breakdown structure. Uh, they call it the COBS um, in the base config. And, and then it has three alternate breakdown structures, uh, and one of which uh, would be for the WBS. And, and that's really how we manage that, so that uh, you can have them flexible, but both of them out there um, to meet the needs of your contractual requirements. And then all that output, um, you know, it, it flows into the business intelligence platform and uh, can be sliced and diced uh, in any way that you need to. Uh, for client reporting or internal reporting. Okay, great. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, when you moved your applications from on-premise to the cloud, was there anything that you were not prepared for? And were there any positive surprises? Um, I guess that, that gives you a lot of flexibility in how you want to answer that. Um, in terms of things not prepared for, um, you know, when we uh, partner with LoadSpring, it really is that. It's a partnership. Um, we have uh, uh, quite a few folks in the organization, um, Mike Dawson, Warren Kruger, Alex. Um, we work with a, a team of folks, uh, meet once a week, and we are working through a project plan uh, to, to migrate. And so there's a lot of support. Um, and, and oftentimes not a lot of surprises because of, of good planning. Um, and so I, I would say that the partnership part has been key to our success and, and will continue to be. Um, and in terms of the positive results, there's just been some bonuses, gravy on top of it. Um, I mean, I love the dashboard. That's going to help with the license management. It makes my life a lot easier. Um, <laughs> I know that. Uh, but then the, the sort of added benefit of um, the fact that they have enterprise Oracle databases at LoadSpring. We're now able to migrate our SQL databases onto these Oracle databases and, and should see improved performance. Um, and uh, so that's like an added benefit. And then the other thing that I was surprised to hear as we were getting into more and more depth of, of the LoadSpring platform is, is the fact that um, we're able to uh, leverage the functional knowledge. Um, so when you're supporting an enterprise, people have technical issues, their, their system goes down, and, and that's really why we're, <laughs> that was one of the primary reasons we were reaching out to LoadSpring is we need more uptime and we need 24-7 support. And that's usually the typical cloud solution. But, but not only that, you know, they, they really do um, have the um, depth of knowledge on the, the project management side of it and, and the actually application of the tools. So some of the functional questions that we get can be handled in the first line of defense at LoadSpring. And so that, that uh, reduces our need for support um, and, uh, you know, reduces our footprint. So it's been a, a very positive uh, transition for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna, we have time for two more questions, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this one from Corey. You've listed many similar industry standard tools available in your LoadSpring platform that do similar functions, i.e. ASTA, Power Project, P6, etc. Have you standardized which core tools to use on specific program projects, or do you leave this up to the project management? Um, we, so there's, that's a great question. Um, we try to deliver um, uh, a standardized platform of tools, suite of tools, um, so that those are ready to go. Um, we have a concept where it's project in a box 
and you literally plug and play um, and that suite of tools is on on the load spring environment and it's housed and, and ready to, to plug and play and, and so that that is sort of our standard but we understand that that each client has its own requirements and they often have preferred tools so we always work uh, to support that um, in any way we can and it's all a part of um, load spring engagement um, in the program space especially you know as we globally support these programs around the world having uptime um, quick uptime and and quick access accessibility to information is so important and uh, and so it is a partnership that as we approach uh, large large programs we'll start with our typical project in a box and then as the as we work to the client requirements adjust as necessary Okay, great. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, final question, and again, if your question wasn't answered, we will take the questions and we will uh, we will disperse them amongst the team members and we will respond back in kind. So uh, my apologies that we weren't able to get to all of them today. You guys had uh, done a swimmingly well job of submitting questions, but the final one for, for today's live session is, will CH2M be using a BI tool to form reports on application data hosted in LoadSpring? Yes, absolutely. Um, that is a, a one point I didn't mention and was absolutely a concern for me because we've created all sorts of APIs and integrations with our ERP system into tools like Ecosys. Um, and uh, those uh, APIs uh, can transition and do transition into the cloud very easily and uh, you know the, the the data back down into the BI application um, is something uh, that I imagine should go just as well as the you know the data flowing in um, we haven't tested that to be honest but I think um, absolutely that the, the API configuration has been uh, to date um, low low effort and um, we've been able to migrate seamlessly into LoadSpring with the current stack as it is today. Great. Michelle, thank you again. Thanks for all the time and effort you put into this and the, the great dialogue that you uh, and best practices that you shared with uh, the team on the webinar today. We really appreciate it. Everyone on the webinar, thank you for your time. Uh, if you do, if you would like to have a cloud assessment con consultation or a risk assessment consultation, please reach out to a load spring at the credentials provided in Dell Tech, the same. We appreciate your time today and look forward to uh, speaking with you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. If you have any other questions, please email us at information at loadspring.com and our experts will get back to you shortly. You will also all receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the LoadSpring team, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.